talk to you about something I love talking about, and I love to study successful people. I've been really blessed in my lifetime to get to know a lot of people that had all kinds of success, and I really don't understand why uh, the Lord put me on that strange kind of a track, but I've just become friends with people who, who have had an inordinate amount of success in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of areas. In a, I've just noticed that there are certain common characteristics that uh, I've really kind of, uh, I really believe a pastor of a church has got a responsibility more than just get you through the difficulties of life, and there are plenty of those. There's a lot of heartache and tragedy. There's a lot of things you're going to have to deal with in this life, and a pastor's job is to walk with you through that, and that's, I take that very seriously. But I also believe that a pastor's job is to help you find your purpose and see that you become so successful in that, in, that, in, that, in that thing that you do, that only you are equipped to do, that they know your name in heaven. In fact, they know your name in hell too. Amen? Come on, somebody. The devil knows who you are because of the impact you've had for the kingdom of God. I think pastors have a job to help people in their congregation be successful. If you believe that, say amen. And so, um, so I've studied this subject, and I'm, I'm, always, I'm always drawn back to Matthew 8, chapter uh, chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, if you would stand for the reading of the word. The title of our message is, Done as You Have Believed. Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, a centurion, by the way, was a Roman officer that was in charge of a thousand men, so he was a fairly high-ranking officer saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in dreadful torment. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and I'll heal him. And the centurion answered and he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. So I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and he said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit and will uh, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed at that same hour. My God, I just bless you in reading the word. You may be seated. So <clears throat> this passage has all kinds of implications. And I teach on it all the time. And it's, it's, it's about the, the authority of the, the, the power of faith and authority and understanding how authority works. The centurion was not a theologian. He just understood authority. Therefore, he was able to access God's authority Pray in Jesus' name. Whatever you ask for in my name shall be done for you. That's what Jesus said. He understood all those principles. But I think Jesus was just making a declarative statement. I will tell you what I believe. I believe in your life what you believe is what happens to you. Good and bad. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced this principle is a general life principle. And that if you're going to be successful... It's going to have to be more than just money to fulfill you. A lot of people need to spend some time quantifying and identifying what success looks like before they ever start on that journey. Let me give you an example from Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. Now, God's going to prosper you. He needs to prosper you because you've got to be an influence on the earth. The ecclesia, we're going to talk about that. You're called to be an influence. You can't be an influence if you're broke unless you're Mother Teresa and she had access to billions of dollars of assets that belong to the Catholic Church. I'm just going to point that out. Hallelujah. She was a wonderful woman. My God, she was a wonderful woman. And I hear a lot of people say, well, she took a power of poverty. poverty. Yeah, but the, the outfit she worked for is the richest institution on the face of the earth. And if she needed, if she needed things, they sent them to her. Come on. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying that if you're going to manage God's physical assets, then you're going to have responsibility to take care of them and to use them in an appropriate way. So, so I want you to see what Jesus said about the, the rich farmer in Luke 12, verse 13 through 21. He and the disciples were going along, and then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And he said to him, Man, who made me judge or arbitrator over you? 
And he said to them, to his disciples, he said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of abundance of things he possesses. And then he spoke a parable to them, and he said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, Fool. He said, You're a fool. He said, This night your soul will be required from you. Then those, then, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, he's not talking about prosperity here. This is a prosperity teaching church. What he's talking about is hoarding wealth. Hoarding wealth. This is why you have to give. When you give, it breaks the spirit of mammon off your wealth. When you give, you prove to God you're committed. When you give, you prove to God that he can trust you. He needs you to gather assets, but not to store them up in barns and hoard them in barns. And recently I've been going through some things, and I've seen it and been around people that have done nothing but store it up and, and, and it's just, it's devastating the effect it has on their life. It brings this sense of self-sufficiency that, that makes them to think they don't really need God. They got everything taken care of, number one. That is a, that's why it's easier for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. It has nothing to do with the money. There's nothing wrong with the money. Money's not, a, money's not an objective. It's a tool. It's something to use. What do you use it for? To advance the cause of the kingdom of God. That's what you use it for. It's harder for, for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to get through an eye of a needle because a rich man thinks he's self-sufficient. He has stored up enough. And Jesus said, this is foolish because trust me, you can never store up enough. You have to be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly dependent on God. You have to be. You have to live like that. So go ahead and give it away and see what happens. I had a very, very, very rich man. I can't tell you how rich he was. Asked me one time. He's a friend of mine. He asked me, he said, he had a lot of problems, lots of problems. He said, what do you think I should do? What can I do? I said, give all your stuff away. He said, what does the Bible, here's what he said. He said, what does the Bible say that I should do? The Bible says you should give all your stuff away. No, really, man. I want some real advice. I said, that's what the Bible says you should do. It says you can take everything and sow it into the kingdom, and you should try living wholly dependent on God. He right away, he could see that all his friends would quit him, all his family would disown him. Might be the best thing that ever happened to him. Come on, somebody. New friends. Whole new life. Living wholly dependent on God. So success is about more than just Making dollars, that can't be the sum total of your, of, your, of your objective, of your success. He responds to this admonition with an admonition about covetousness. They ask him to settle a dispute. And he said, he said, I'm warning you, beware of all covetousness. This happens to be in the tenth of the Ten Commandments. The Hebrew word interpreted as covenant is, is kamad. It means to lust for. It's the same word in Proverbs 6.25 that says, the, the Lord warns men about seductive women. He said, do not lust for kabod after her in your heart. Lust is an excess of desire. And the world tells you that lust is the definition of love, and that's where they get really screwed up on a lot of stuff. Jesus said, my definition of love, there is no greater thing, John 15, 13, there is no greater thing that a man can do than to give his life for his friends. Love, agape love, the love that Jesus talked about, the Greek word he used, agape, means this. It means you want the good for somebody. You want good for somebody. And you're willing for the good to even cost you something. You're willing to do something, give away something, sacrifice something for their good because you care about them and you want the good for people. Covetedness is an excess of desire. It's when you lust after something. When you start to lust after people's wealth, God can't trust you with wealth. You're in real trouble. You ever known anybody like that? 
The next thing you know, all you're thinking about is what it would be like to have all of their money. Let me tell you what it would be like. It would be headaches galore. I've learned that from the wealthy men that I've gotten to know in my life. It can be a curse if it's not totally committed to God. Wealth can be a curse if it's not totally committed to God. Doing good for others should be one of your motivations for your success. How do you define it? If you're a teacher, it's creating other great teachers, helping other teachers be successful. If you're a doctor, it's healing lives and saving lives. If you're a nurse, it's convalescing people back to health. If you're an artist, it's producing something that makes and inspires people. That's good. How many of you know that's good? If you're, if, you're, if you're a pastor, it's watching people grow up and be successful as they begin to apply kingdom principles in their life and they get free of them. Is there anybody worthy? Is there anybody whole? That's what the lyric that we just sang was. Pastor's number one job is to help people get whole because I tell you what, you're not when you come through those doors the first time. The devil has done a job on you and until you get hold you can't be who god's created you to be that's the first thing you have to help people do is help them heal and get whole help them allow the holy spirit to begin to flow in their life and to begin to make them and form them into who god created them to be so success can be like about your legacy for farmers this is why i think these two farmers are so successful both these men and their sons and their family are concerned about legacy. They want the land to be better when they die and leave it to that next generation than it was when they got it. This is their number one preoccupation with their thinking. Is Does this make the land better or does it hurt it? That's all they care about. And so they want this legacy of making it better than you found it. This is a pretty good way to live your life. Amen? What if we did that with the church? What if we did that with our schools? What if we did that with every institution? We just want to make it better than it was when we found it. Amen? The legacy can be about leaving a legacy for your children. It's more than just making money. You want your children to also inherit your values. See? Not just your money. You want them to inherit your values. Dennis Prager said something that just blew me away. The greatest single thing you can do to help society and help the world is to raise good children. Raise children that become good people. That's the greatest thing you can do to change the world. Think about that for a minute. That's your legacy. So it won't do any good if you give them all your money and they don't have your values because if you do that, they'll squander the money. Can I get a witness out of somebody? If you don't give them and instill values in them, if you don't teach them that they're more important than the money is, if you don't teach them that the money is just a tool for them to do good with, that they manage the money, they don't let the money manage them. That they take care of it like a steward, but it belongs to God. When you teach them those values, guess what happens? You can perpetuate wealth that way. If you don't, there'll be one generation will make it, the next generation will live on it, the third generation will lose it. That's what bankers will tell you. That's the standard MO. When the children don't learn the values of the parents, they just get the money of the parents. Come on, somebody. The greatest thing you can do is bring your children to Jesus Christ. Get them saved. Teach them how to live holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Dependent on him. You know what that means? That means sometimes you don't give them no money. <laughs> that means every time they turn around and need something or want something, you don't necessarily give them the money. Come on, somebody. Some of the greatest lessons I learned is when I was broke. Maybe the only really good lessons that I learned is when I was broke. And I had to depend completely on Jesus. Success, then, has got to be based on your values that you impart to others, your legacy. If you live your life dedicated to alleviating the suffering of others, how about we just try that? How about we just decide, starting today, we're going to do what we can to alleviate the suffering we find all around us. I know that <clears throat> there are a lot of times when Adam and Anastasia will not even tell me, and someone in our church is sick or hurting or something, and, and they, they start taking things over there to them, and I find out about it later that they've been meeting their needs. I didn't know they had a need. Adam and Anastasia are already taking stuff over there to them and, and going by there once a day, and, and, uh, and uh, 
and figuring out what their needs are and, 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 and because they just have a heart for people around them that are suffering. They want to help them. Come on, somebody. That's a good motivation. So that's got to be part of your success. The definition of success is to alleviate suffering. How about becoming a successful businessman and employing people that can't get work anywhere else? That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good thing to do, amen? Your definition of success has got to be based on your values, though. Do you know what your values are? So this is the number one problem that I find in people. They don't even know what their values are. I'm going to just give you a challenge. Why don't you go home and sit down and think about what is important to you? What is important to you? And make a list of the values that are your values. Don't make them like somebody else's. Make your list. This is who you are. If I looked at your values being your pastor, I could tell you. I'm just telling you. If you would be honest with yourself and me be a good pastor, and I'm not always a good pastor, but I know most of you pretty good, if I could look at the list, I could tell you who it was. Make a list of your values. What's important to you? God and his word. That's my number one. I have seven values I live my life by. Then put them in priority because one of my other values is work. I believe in work. I think work is important. I think it's important for men to work. I'm just going to say it. I think it's important for men to work. I think a pastor has ought to work too. You know, I was out here mowing here the other day. I wasn't out here gropping and complaining. I really enjoyed it because I can get away from you for a while to just get on a tractor, hallelujah, and mow. Not worry about your problems or anything else. I can just mow. That's a great thing. I know pastors say, oh, I ain't going to do no mowing. I said, brother, you in my church, you just be long for the day you can get on a tractor and just tune everything out and just mow, hallelujah. So that's one of my priorities. But here's the thing, I have to put it in priority because if I put work over God and I live my life that way for a while, that ain't no good. Come on, somebody. So write down your values, the things that you value, and put them in the order of the importance in your life. This is the first thing you got to do to build your, your, your vision for success. A lot of people are depressed because they're living a life that's contrary and contrary to their values. Amen? So if I told you you can't teach anymore, you just have to be an administrator, teaching's over, we're going to promote you, but you're just going to be, you know, approving the curriculum and doing all that. You can't do any one-on-one teaching. You last about six months and you're done. You, and you get depressed and you don't even know why you're depressed. Because you, that's what the world said. That's what a promotion is, is to be able to, well, guess what? Her heart is that she's a teacher. When you're living your life inconsistent with your values, you become depressed. Psychologists call it cognitive dissonance. You're doing things every day that you really are not right. Come on. Anybody had a job like that? So get your values figured out and then begin to get to live according to those values and use that to define what success looks like. You have to figure out first what success looks like. There are three things you got to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to outline three principles of success that are very important. Are you ready? Number one, you've got to develop a positive default personality. You have to develop a positive default personality because you're born with a negative default personality. The way you're wired up, you pay more attention to negative stuff than you do positive stuff because the negative stuff could kill you and that's not really good. So you're, you, you, you're preoccupied with, oh, the virus, oh, my neighbor got it. And fear begins to come into you. And so, and, and I'm just using the virus because that's the one the enemy's used recently to, to, to really throw a lot of people off the track. But, but let's forget about the virus for a minute. Let's, say, let's just say that uh, you, have a, you have a financial setback. And the IRS sends you a letter. Anybody ever had letters from the IRS besides me? I don't like to correspond with those guys. I don't. Anyway, and they say, guess what? You owe us. No, I don't know. Yeah, you do. Guess who wins that argument? Anybody have any idea who wins that? Well, all of a sudden, you're wrecked. Your financial plan. See, how do you react to that? How do you react to that? That's what I'm asking. Life is not, is, listen, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And when you have a destabilizing event, or you have something that throws you off the track, your default is always negative. It's always going to be negative. You have to let the Holy Ghost completely renovate you from the inside out so you can learn to think positive. And here's the way positive people think. 
I'm going to take lemon and make lemonade out of it. Their adversity, so write this down. Adversity breeds opportunity. Adversity breeds opportunity. When you're in adversity, instead of saying, God, oh my God, where are you? Here's what positive people do. Where's the door? God has shut one door. He's opening another one. Lord, don't let me miss the door. Lord, don't let me miss the new opportunity that's coming out of this adverse circumstance that I'm trapped in. Moses was on the bank of the Red Sea, a ridiculous place to camp. Pharaoh said, well, God ain't with him now, or he would be camped there because he's a sitting duck. The Egyptians come after him, and what happens? The obstacle becomes the course. God opens the Red Sea. I'm telling you, in your adversity that you face, the obstacle becomes the course. Which way do you want me to go, God? Through. The answer is through. Not around, not under, not over, through. And when you go through, guess what happens? You develop a character. You develop a strengthening of your character. You develop a new, new revelation with God for, for what God wants you to do. And you find that on the other side of the obstacle was the greatest opportunity that you've ever seen in your life. Positive people know that in adversity, there's opportunity. Come on, somebody. They know how to take their circumstance and mold it into something positive. Amen? You have to develop a positive default personality. That doesn't mean that you are uh, unrealistic or stupid about the circumstance. What it means is you know the circumstance is bad, but you know God's in control. And somehow, what was meant for your harm is going to be turned to your good. I've lived my life by that. My brother's got a rare form of cancer, they say. They say that it's not survivable and all that stuff. And I said, yeah, that's what they said. You know, I told him, I said, remember when they said your liver wasn't any good? And now they said, well, his liver's pretty good. This must be the... I said, Roger always tells me they're practicing. They're practicing, Clay. They're practicing. It says so on their certificate. They're wonderful people. They're wonderful people. And they want to help and they want... But I said, you can't live your life based on a fear that's created, you've got to believe in something supernatural if you're going to overcome. Somewhere in this adverse situation, there's an opportunity. Come on, somebody. There's an opportunity. You've got to find it. When you find it and you get good at that, you become successful. Number two, successful people don't ever become disoriented. Successful people don't become disoriented. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, my people perish. The New King James Version says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. When life, stable, some, 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 some event happens, destabilizing event happens in your life, the first thing people do is they throw away their vision. They throw away their goals. Oh, I can't go to college now. I can't, I can't do it. That's not what positive, successful people do. They may change their course, but they never change their vision. They never change their end Goal, game. They never change. They're aiming at something. They don't live their life aimlessly. They're aiming at something and they continue to aim on it even though they might acknowledge they got to get there a little bit different way, but they don't lose the vision. You can't lose the vision. If you lose the vision for your life, you're lost. Can I get a witness out of somebody? If you lose the vision for your life, you're lost. Your life vision defines your orientation. Orientation is more than just a goal. Orientation is knowing where you are now. If I'm going to get a map and I'm going to get oriented on the map, I'm going to figure out where I am now and figure out where I'm going. It's the path. It's the path. Successful people don't become disoriented in times of upheaval. They never lose the vision. The vision is a picture of what success looks like, what the aim of their life is. It should be vivid. It ought to be full of details. This vision has, described, has, has guided my life now through ups and downs for 22 years. There's times when I've gone, God, this is crazy. And then there's other times like right now where I go, thank you, Jesus. You've done everything you said you would do. How many of y'all know we're living in an entirely different scenario than they are in the rest of the country? If you know that, say amen. We're living in a healed land. God is fixing to move in power on us on this. If we can get everybody to wake up and look up, 
And, not, and take your eyes off the media. Can I tell you, the media uses this negative, this, this propensity for negativity to try to trap you into watching because they're all fighting for market share. The media business is in terrible shape. So what they do is, is they, they, they just put negative stuff out there to, raise, to stir your emotion up because they know that fear is the easiest way to capture you. Don't get your view of reality through the media because it's a warped lens. If you believe that, say amen. So, successful people don't lose their orientation when they get into difficult circumstances. They stick with their goals. Number three, successful people always see their efforts as kingdom building. They always see their efforts as kingdom building. There's no greater legacy than to have expanded the kingdom of God in cultural influence. You have to understand what church is. William Tyndale got... William Tyndale got basically executed as a heretic in the 1500s. If you get a Tyndale Bible, you need to read it. He interpreted, he was a scholar in Greek and Hebrew both, and he took the original manuscript and he did the first Tyndale Bible. He was a contemporary of Martin Luther's, but they, Martin Luther quoted him often, but they weren't really close. He was an Englishman, Luther was a German. And he, and he did the Tyndale Bible and he got to Matthew Chapter 16, verse 18, it says, Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so, <clears throat> so the word church, where does the word church come from? And Tyndale said, Jesus didn't use a connotation of church as we think of it now. You know the story of this? This is where Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, and God says, Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't show you this. It's by the Spirit you know this. And he says, and on this rock. And he wasn't talking about Peter. The Greek word for Peter is Petros. It means like a rock or a pebble, something you skip across the lake. This term, he said, on this rock I shall build my church is Petra. It's like a monolithic thing like the rock of Gibraltar. On this, on this foundation of spiritual revelation of my identity as a Savior, until one becomes born again and can't see the kingdom of God. On that rock, on that process, I will build my church. But the word for church, Jesus didn't use a theological term. He used a secular term that came out of Greek, the Greek society that the Greeks have had the ecclesia for years. That's the word he used. It was interpreted as church. And the ecclesia was not a church. It was a, it was a body of people, about 10% of the Greek population that were selected and equipped to make all the decisions for Greek society. You couldn't become a magistrate in a court without approval of the ecclesia. Greece couldn't go to war without approval of the ecclesia. They met once a week. What did they do once a week? They made offerings to their sun god and various things, but in that time also they sat around and talked about what are the, what are the trials or what's the struggles of the day, and they decided what Greece ought to do. The ecclesia of Jesus is supposed to be leading the United States, not following it whimpering like a whoop pup. The ecclesia is supposed to be the leaders of the culture. They're supposed to define what's culturally appropriate and what's not. That's what the ecclesia, that's what the term ecclesia means. And so, and so you, should be, you should be a person of great influence. What does God want you to do? He wants you to be the best teacher in the whole school system. What does, why? Because you have influence there. What does he want to do in your business? He wants you to be the most successful businessman in that field because you have great influence there. He wants you to be the best surgeon. He wants you to be, why? Why does he, why does he always want you to be the best? Because he wants you to be successful and put you in a position to have influence on the culture. My God. And, and Tyndale told him, he said, you guys have taken this whole term ecclesia and you've warped it and twisted it into a, an ecclesiastical order of bishops and archbishops and cardinals and popes. And then you have, then you have been corrupted and that's become political. There's a guy named Frederick Nietzsche. He's a pretty interesting dude. If your kids go to college, they'll stuff that Nietzsche down their throat until they regurgitate it back up. Nietzsche was a philosopher in the late 20, or the early 20th century, and he hated the church. And his, he, was, he, was a, he was a son of a Lutheran minister who was a son of a Lutheran minister who was a son of a Lutheran minister, and he hated the church. And the reason he hated the church, he famously said, there's only been one Christian, his name is Jesus Christ. 
And the reason he hated the church was the church had become rotten when he lived. It was just a political apparatus for power. And they controlled everything. You had to, you had to go to Oxford University. You had to, you had to agree with the top 23 tenants of the, of the Church of England before you could be enrolled. They controlled everything. And Neat saw that it was counterfeit, and it was counterfeit. Neats never believed it could be reformed, but it could. And so he famously said, God is dead, we've killed him. What he was saying was not that he had killed him. He was saying the church itself had killed the concept. They killed the concept of ecclesia. They really did. And they turned it into a political machine. Well, reform has come, and we're in the remnant church that's now rising that has recovered the meaning of ecclesia. If you believe that, say amen. And sees now what the whole mission has been about. It's about building the kingdom's influence on earth. We're so busy trying to get to heaven. I can get you to heaven in five minutes if you just really want to go. Everybody's chuckling because they know that crazy son of a buck would probably do it. Why are you such a hurry to get to heaven? How about if we build on earth as it is in heaven? How about if we build a system here on the earth that mimics heaven in every detail where God's people have great influence, compassion, and love on those that are hurting and alleviates suffering and helps people get out of the mess that they're in and makes them whole and makes them successful? How about that? That's the church I'm signed up for. That's the ecclesia that Jesus was talking about. Not a politically corrupt institution. Amen? Successful people are about building the kingdom. Tyndale said, you guys have warped the meaning and you've built your own political machine. The ecclesia is supposed to be vested in those that have had a born-again experience. They're supposed to come together in an assembly and they're supposed to discuss, pray over, and have influence over the important issues of the day. And it got him burned at the stake. The political people didn't like that. Amen? So, whatever you do, you have to define success. It's got, part of it has got to be you're building the influence of the kingdom on earth. I want to talk about three principles, biblical principles, that also are characteristics of successful people. Uh, and science is catching up. I love to watch science catch up there to invalidate biblical principles. One is Galatians chapter uh, 1, verse 10. Do I persuade men or God? I cannot please men. If I'm, if I'm a pleaser of men, I can't be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Modern psychologists say it's essential that you stop caring what everybody else thinks. You have to stop that. You've got to live your life before an audience of one. There's one person who need, you need to worry about what he thinks. His name is Jesus Christ. He died for you to save you. He's the one that's got to influence you. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those that commend themselves. Listen, if you don't stop comparing yourself to other people, you will never fulfill your destiny. Listen, Psalm 139, verse 16 for my eyes, your eyes, Lord, saw my substance being yet even unformed. And in your book, they are all written. What's written there? The days you fashioned for me. When as yet there were none of them. God has a book with your name in heaven. It has a, it has a, it has a goal for you. It has a, a, a definition of success for your life. It has what he has assigned you to do in this world here. And if you quit, don't quit trying to be like someone else, you're going to miss your mission. You're going to help them fulfill theirs, but you're going to miss your mission. That drags you away from what God has for you. Quit worrying about what other people think and be who God created you to be. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Because your circumstance is unique, your story is unique, and that's the way it has to be. You have to live your life for the Lord alone. There was a gold medalist in the Olympics a woman named Sydney McLaughlin. And she said something after setting a world record in the 400-meter hurdles that just really blew me away. I don't know if you can see her picture up here. Can somebody dim the lights a little bit back there? Can we get somebody back there? Scott, can you dim? Scott doesn't know what buttons to push. If Scott tries to dim the lights, the place will catch fire probably. But I, w I want you to read this, what she said. After she set the world record, won the gold medal, she said, 
Records come and go, but the glory of God is eternal. I no longer run for self-recognition, but to reflect his perfect will, which is already set in stone. I don't deserve anything, but by grace through faith, Jesus has given me everything. There is a sister who is living her life successfully, knows who she is in Christ, what she's called to do, living holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, dependent on him, and God has made her an absolute world-famous athlete. She's used these principles. All three of these principles are working in her life. This is dying to self, not caring. How many of you know what courage it took for her to say those things? How many of you know how persecuted she was right after she said those things? She didn't care. I wish I could find some Christians that quit caring what the world says or what the world thinks. They're going to hell. Let's just go ahead and speak truth and let them rise up and get angry about it, but let's just love them, but let's keep telling the truth. You don't love somebody. You don't want the good for somebody if you don't tell them the way things really are. Amen? Principle number three. He said, let it be done as you believe. Your faith is what lines up your life. Listen, Dr. Jordan Peterson said this. Check this out. The world reconfigures itself. Now, this is a medically proven, a psychologically proven fact. This is why I love when science catches up with, with Jesus. The world reconfigures itself around what you aim at. What you aim at determines the way the world manifests itself to you. So you better be careful what you aim for. What's he trying to say? He said psychologists have proven that if you have a goal, if you have a vision, if you have, see, we use vision in the church. They don't use that in psychology. They just call it goals or whatever. If you have that vision, what happens is the, wor the world begins to organize. What you begin to observe begins to organize around that thing, that the objective that you are trying to achieve. And so if you're not careful about what you're aiming at, you're gonna, and if you aim at nothing, that's what you're going to hit, nothing. Come on. Live your life aimlessly, and the world is just going to be haphazard. You're going to go from one disaster to the next and wonder where God is. But when you live your life with purpose and you aim at something that God has given you to aim at, the world begins to organize itself around that thing that you're aiming for. This has been scientifically proven. It's a psychological fact, and Jesus said it 2,000 years ago over. He said, let it be done unto you as you believe. Whatever you believe deeply, that's what's going to manifest in your life. You cannot win. You can't win the 400 meters hurdles if you don't believe God puts you there and he intends for you to win them. You have to have that deep. Is this making, if I can change what you believe about yourself, I can make you successful. It has nothing to do whether God wants to or not. Who are you, God? Waiting for you to figure out who you are and start doing what he's given you to do. Amen? Get a little preachy now, aren't I? And then the third principle. You have to invest in order to succeed. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, so shall he reap. If you don't invest, I want to be, be a doctor. Well, then you need to start going to school. I don't, I don't care what it is. I want to be... I want to help people. I want to, I want to, I want to have, a, I want to have a, a, a benevolence ministry. Well, get started. Invest. You have to invest. One of my 12 principles of life is you have to invest to succeed. You have to invest time. You have to invest energy. You have to invest effort. You have to invest money. You have to invest prayer. If you're going to be successful, you have to invest. Amen? How, what do you think Sidney McLaughlin has invested in becoming a gold medalist athlete. You have to sacrifice. The ethos of sacrifice is this. You're showing God commitment. You're showing him you're willing to make a sacrifice to become who he's called you to become. Amen? i got news for you. I'll bet you a dollar to a donut. The city of McLaughlin don't eat what I eat. Hallelujah. <laughs> I bet she don't even know what a bra and a strawberry milkshake tastes like. Poor, poor thing. I'll tell her. I'll describe it for her. 
But she's had to make sacrifices. This is the other part of Christianity that I just kind of resent just a little bit and sometimes is because the whole thing of giving is to teach you that and to show God commitment. Sacrifice is about demonstrating commitment. Well, if you're going to be a great athlete, you have to do the work to become a great athlete. If you're going to be a teacher, you've got to invest in education. If you're going to be a farmer, how many of you know farming takes tremendous amount of sacrifice? These guys were at a farm conference last week in St. Louis. I don't think they learned anything, but they had a good time. Hallelujah. That's the main thing. They sacrificed to, 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 to keep. Teachers, teachers have to constantly do their, their, their uh, what do they call it, where they have, to, they have to go to courses. They have to continue to increase. They have to continue, what, do you, what do you call that? Continuing education. What a novel idea. Teachers got to do it. You can't be a teacher if you don't invest in your career. Amen. And I just, lazy Christians, I just I have a problem. I mean, I'm, I maybe I'm just, don't come to me with your, don't come to me and tell me all these things you want God to do for you when you ain't willing to sacrifice anything. You're not willing to invest. You have to invest to be successful. Amen. You got to be who God called you to be. Quit trying to be like somebody else. You have to get something and aim at it. Aim at it. Brother Brian's an engineer and a minister. That's a crazy combination, too. They have you, they, you pray over the equipment down at the plant. Sometimes they have to lay, you have to lay hands on it. His plant, by the way, you remember when the lights were blinking back here? Several They were having to have... His, his plant's the one that saved our bacon. Amen. They have the co only coal-fired plant in this part of the country, and they were producing power like crazy. They had it ginned up down at, down at the talk station mule shoe, or we'd have had days probably going without lights. Amen. My point is that I love you, and I want you to be successful, but don't come to me with that mealy mouth. I don't know what God wants me to be. Figure out something. Just figure it out. And look, just here's the thing. Life's a 10-lane highway. Just pick a lane. I want to be an educator. Well, that's great. Let's get started. Well, what do you want to teach? I don't know yet. Well, that's okay. I want to be, I want to be in the medical field. Well, what are you going to be? You're going to be a radiography guy? You're going to be, it doesn't matter. Just start heading in that general direction and it'll clear up as you go. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Amen. I have a broken record, Lord. I believe in you guys. See, it's never, it's, never been the, it's never been the most likely ones that God has poured his grace out on. It's always the most unlikely, ridiculous person. Nobody would ever think that's who God pours his grace into and makes famous. He uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He uses the weak things to bring the, strength, the strong to their knees. He uses the most unlikely people. All you have to do is decide you're going to do something to build a kingdom. You have to define success according to your values. You've got to figure out what your values are. You've got to live your life according to those things. You've got to love Jesus with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. And I have this theory. You want to hear it? No one is unsuccessful that does those things. Nobody. Nobody who has vision... Nobody that lives the way Jesus says to live, no one that figures out who they are and pursues that is unsuccessful. I've not met one. I've not met one. Has this helped you? I want you to spend this next week, I want you, Roger's going to come back and preach on the kingdom too. What a great message. I got to hear part of that. And this is what we're talking about. Let's take the power of the kingdom and bring it to bear in our circumstance where we are. Let's do that. Let's, let's start. Dylan's going to Futurity Horse Show. It's the biggest horse show of his whole career. He's nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I said, you know what? I said, you just got to go there and, 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 and go out there and get a little experience and just keep improving and keep improving. But that's his vision. He wants to do that. He wants to pursue that. If he'll put God in it with him and God partner with him, he, how many of you believe he'll be successful? Come on, somebody. This is the thing. It's the thing. If you make God your partner, there's no limit to what you can do.